Hello friends and welcome to One Saturday Morning. I'm Daryl Dukes. Our leading story this morning is the Baltimore riots. Earlier this week, the mayor of Baltimore lifted up a 10 p.m. to 5 a.m. curfew in the city, which means that at some given point this week, the National Guard was gone since in order the National Guard to be staying there, it had to be under a state of emergency, which that too was also lifted. In a few moments, we're going to toss over to a clip from CNN about the mayor announcing that the curfew has been lifted. But before that, the Baltimore City um, attorney has announced that six officers, which we'll have a clip to show you courtesy of our friends at the Associated Press, has been charged involved has been charged in the death of an armed African American man who died a week after his injury after the officers refused to give him medical attention. So, as of right now, we're going to show you both videos back to back. The first one is going to be the, about the mayor of Baltimore lifting up the, um, the curfew, and the second one will be from the Associated Press with the Baltimore um, City Attorney announcing all the charges to the six officers that's been involved. Take a look. The city's mayor lifting the week-long 10 p.m. curfew, optimistic about what comes next. I think a lot of the unrest has been settled, settled down in the sense of the protest, but that doesn't mean the work doesn't continue. And so far, so good. Thousands gathering in front of City Hall Sunday, a sea of people with different religious beliefs and backgrounds together at this interfaith rally organized by the church. We have Buddhists, we have Catholics, we have Jews, all coming together fighting for one Baltimore to come together. And the 4,000 National Guard troops spread throughout Baltimore met with praise. Thank you. Thank you for everything you did. And prayer as the governor delivered the orders for them to withdraw. It's not going to happen instantaneously. It's going to take a couple of days to get everybody out. We had to build an entire city to save the city. However, the economic impact of Monday's riots is staggering. 200 businesses destroyed by flames or looting. Hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue lost. But Mondawmin Mall, where it all started, bounces back. It is such a dramatic difference from where it was on Monday. I'm just so uh, grateful because it shows the resiliency of our city. Sunday's rally also being deemed a celebration after the announcement of the arrest and indictment for all six officers involved in the death of Freddie Gray. The medical examiner's determination that Mr. Gray's death was a homicide, which we received today, has led us to believe that we have probable cause to file criminal charges. Signifying for many one step toward the justice they're calling for. We have brought the following charges. Officer Caesar Goodson is being charged with second degree depraved heart murder, involuntary manslaughter, second degree negligent assault, manslaughter by vehicle by means of gross negligence, manslaughter by vehicle by means of criminal negligence, misconduct in office for failure to secure a prisoner, failure to render aid. Officer William Porter, is being charged with involuntary manslaughter, assault in the second degree, misconduct in office. Lieutenant Brian Rice is being charged with involuntary manslaughter, assault in the second degree, assault in the second degree, misconduct in office, false imprisonment. Officer Edward Nero is being charged with assault in the second degree, intentional. Assault in the second degree, negligent, misconduct in office, false imprisonment. Officer Garrett Miller is being charged with this intentional assault in the second degree. Assault in the second degree, negligent, misconduct in office, and false imprisonment. Sergeant Alicia White is being charged with manslaughter, involuntary manslaughter, second degree assault, misconduct in office. Stay with News Now Nation for more um, details regarding the whole um, Baltimore riots. Turning now to the Race for 270, which is our political coverage for the Race for the Presidency in 2016. Three people have announced that they are going to run for president this past week. The first one being Carly Flanning, who announced her run on ABC News' Good Morning America morning show this past week, which we'll see a clip about that in a few minutes. Then Ben Carlson, former neosurgeon, 
African American neurosurgeon announced that he is running for president. And of course, not too long after, Mike Huckabee, former governor of Arkansas and former Fox News weekend host of his um, show, Huckabee, announced that he was going to run. So this is what we're going to do. Um, the first clip we're going to show, um, Carly Fu uh, Fuona, who was the former Herbert Packer CEO who laid off 30,000 people during her tenure there, her announcement on CBS, um, excuse me, ABC News announcing to the whole world and to um, chief anchor George Stephanopoulos that she's going to be running for president on the GOP ticket. Then afterwards, you're going to see, courtesy of our friends at the Columbia Broadcasting System, CBS, on who is Ben Carson, because not too many people know about this famous neosurgeon. And after that, we're going to show you um, Mike Huckabee's announcement for presidency. After you see all those clips, we're going to go into some real clear numbers. So enjoy these clips, and we'll be right back with you. I'm here with Carly Fiorina, the former tech CEO. Republican Party leader has been traveling the country exploring a run for president. Tweeted out last night that she's coming on GMA to make some big news. So welcome to GMA. Let's get right to it. Are you running for president? Why are you the best person for the job? Yes, I am running for president. I think I'm the best person for the job because I understand how the economy actually works. I understand the world, who's in it, how the world works. I understand bureaucracies, and that's what our federal government has become, a giant, bloated, unaccountable, corrupt bureaucracy. I understand technology, which is a tool both to reimagine government and to re-engage citizens in the process of government. And I understand executive decision making, which is making a tough call in a tough time with high stakes for which you're prepared to be held accountable. Just, I don't think you read about that. You learn it by doing it. You just laid out all your experience. But as you know, almost every single one of our presidents has held elective office. Mm. The ones who haven't have served in the cabinet, have served in the military. So how do you convince voters that you have the relevant experience to be yeah. president? Well, that, what you just said is true over the last 50 or 60 years, but it isn't how our nation started. Our nation was intended to be a citizen government. And somehow we've come to this place in our nation's history where we think we need a professional political class. I don't believe that. And I will tell you, as I've been out there across the country, people don't believe that either. They're kind of tired of the political class. And uh, they believe that we need to return to a citizen government. This is a pivotal point for our nation. And so I think it's totally reasonable to look outside the political class that's been in Washington for a really long time. You know, as you've been traveling around the country, you've had some tough things to say about Hillary Clinton. You said she's not trustworthy, flawed character, does not know what leadership means. But back in 2008, you called her a focused, intelligent, empathetic, and powerful leader. So what changed? Well, she is focused. She is empathetic to a certain degree. She's highly intelligent. She's hardworking. She's dedicated her life to public service. All of those things are very admirable. So I have a lot of admiration for Hillary Clinton, but she clearly is not trustworthy. She has not been transparent about a whole set of Based things that what? matter. She wasn't transparent about Benghazi. In fact, just the opposite. She peddled a fiction about it for a month. She hasn't been transparent about her server and her emails. And now we see all of these foreign government donations to the Clinton Global Initiative at a time when she was Secretary of State, at a time when she said she would disclose those donations, all of those things get to trustworthiness. So it sounds like you're ready to take her on, you're ready to run, you just announced you're running, and you're going to come back later in the program to talk to Robin about your brand new book, Rising to the Challenge. People are afraid to actually talk about what they want to say because somebody might be offended. Dr. Ben Carson makes miracles look easy. For his skills as a surgeon, high moral standards, and dedication to helping others, I am proud to bestow the Presidential Medal of Freedom on Dr. Benjamin S. Carson, Sr. Obamacare is really, I think, the worst thing that has happened in this nation since slavery. So it seems perfectly fitting that it would be here that I announce that I am a candidate for President of the United States of America. We were promised hope, 
but it was just talk. And now we need the kind of change that really could get America from hope to higher ground. <laughs> Government in Washington is, is dysfunctional because it's become the Roach Motel. People go in, but they never come out. There is no constitutional authority to dictate education from the federal government. Why even have a federal department of education? It's flunked and it needs to be expelled. I don't have a global foundation or a taxpayer funded paycheck to live off of. I don't come from a family dynasty, but a working family. I grew up blue collar, not blue blood. So I ask you to join with me today, not just so I can be president, but so we can preserve this great republic and someday so that your children and grandchildren can still go from hope to higher ground. Okay, this is the part of the show where we get into the numbers of the race for 270, which is our coverage for the race of the White House. Uh, it's time for real clear numbers. Now, these numbers actually reflect from um, March 26 of this year to 421 of this year. So, um, let's dive into it. In the GOP side, we have Senator Marco Rubio leading out of the current announced on presidential candidates with 11.8%. Ted Cruz is right behind with 9%. Then Rand Paul is ahead by Cruz by 0.3% with 9.3%. Former Governor Mike Huckabee is right behind Paul with 8.3%. Neosurgeon Ben Carson is has 4.8%. And former HP CEO um, Carly Florena has literally 1%. Um, on the Democrat side, you have... Former um, um, Secretary of State Harry Clinton leading with 62.2% and Bernie Sanders with 5.6%. Every week on one Saturday morning leading up to the election, we'll give you the numbers that you need to know so you can base a decision come election day next year on who to vote for if um, they do not drop out of the race. Now, staying, turning, um, turning pages here. A few days ago, actually, um, this past Sunday, it was a shooting in Garland, Texas, where basically at this convention where people were draw drawing, essentially mocking the Prophet Muhammad, and two people who represented the terrorist group ISIL came there and started to cause a, what many people consider to be a terrorist attack. Um, we'll give you the full story right now from our friends at the Associated Press. Take a look. Authorities in Garland, Texas say two gunmen are dead after an attack outside a cartoon contest on Sunday. Police say the gunman drove up to the Curtis Colwell Center and shot and wounded a security officer. The Garland officers that were close by saw what was going on, engaged the two men, shot and killed them both there at the scene. Police knew the contest in suburban Dallas could be a target because it featured cartoon depictions of the Muslim prophet Muhammad. So far, so far as threats, we've been monitoring this for several months. Uh, so far as a credible threat that we had like this event that happened, no. The event featured a speech by a Dutch lawmaker who's known for criticizing Islam. An Associated Press microphone was inside the building when attendees learned of the attack. Please officers have been shot. Two suspects have been shot. Wow. Possibly have explosives on them, okay? That's what we're worried about right now. Wow. We are going to move y'all into the auditorium here in just a minute. Police used robots to check the gunman's vehicle for explosives. We're considering their car at possibly containing a bomb. So our bomb unit is there. They're still working on that vehicle. Uh, and that's where we are at this time. So far as identifications or anything on the men, we've not touched their bodies because they're close by the car. The wounded security guard was treated at a hospital and released. Sandy Kozell, the Associated Press. Okay, we're back and stay with News Now Nation for more details regarding about that story and all the other stories that you have seen today. Finally today, I'm keeping it honest about Al Jazeera America and a $15 million lawsuit. Now, before, um, I have did a Keeping It Honest strictly to Al Jazeera once they first came on the air 
over a year ago. And I love how they basically do a hard international news, which we don't see now ever since the late Peter Jennings died back in 2005 and the Dan Riders and the Tom Brokaw. Everything has essentially got watered down. But when I read this week that um, a former employee basically sued Al Jazeera America for basically $15 million for anti-Semitic and other things that's not valuable to the network, it bothered me a little bit that why um, why is the person suing the network for that much? Why couldn't they just talk this out the normal way instead of basically slapping a $15 million lawsuit on them? Now, as a result of this lawsuit, key people had to step down or basically resign from their position because of that. We don't know whether it, the, um, the allegations in the lawsuit are true or not for them to step down. I'm not too sure of that, but it bothers me that, pe that a former employee would sue a good network, in my point of view, for $15 million. In addition, there was a, um, a report by um, this website, CNN Con Commentary, that former chief business correspondent at CNN, now host of Real Money with Ali Velshi, and essentially one of the guys that Al Jazeera first, Al Jazeera America, sorry, first hired, Al, um, Ali Velshi, is basically going, um, the people who's running Al Jazeera America, in a sense, wants to basically have them bankrupt. So now, again, this is unconfirmed, that Ali Velshi is in talks of trying to talk, trying to get his old job back at the cable news network, which he has denied it, and whoever make it, whoever is accusing um, both the um, CEO of Al Jazeera and Ali of making Ali Velshi go broke is disheartening because let's face it, Al um, Ali Velshi was the first man Al Jazeera America hired away from a big time network, i.e. CNN. So. In a way, it bothers me, and I hope that this, you know, will hopefully fade to black at some given point soon. Well, that's it for this edition of One Saturday Morning. I'm Daryl Dudes. If it's Saturday, then it's One Saturday Morning. Stay good, everybody. Until next time.